for this for today's uh, webinar on open source best practices from continuous integration to static linters. We uh, had more than 150 people registering for this webinar. Uh, the webinar is going to be presented by Daniel Smith and Ben Pritchard. Uh, they are from the, so the Molecular Sciences Software Institute. The goal of the Institute is to serve as a nexus for science education cooperation serving the uh, a wide community of computational molecular scientists. It includes biomolecular bio simulation, quantum chemistry, and material science. Ben has a background in computational chemistry. Uh, he got his PhD from the University of Buffalo, and he has a passion for computer programming. Uh, he has been working on the accuracy and the precision of computational chemistry calculations. He's also interested in long-term maintainability and reproducibility in computational sciences. Daniel has been work has worked quite a bit in projects like uh, open source scientific projects like NumPy and and Psi4 packages, and also uh, he has an interest in educational outreach through uh, the software carpentry and the educational activities offered by the Molecular Sciences Software Institute. Uh, his uh, research interests uh, currently focuses on community databases for quantum chemistry. And this, uh, the idea is to add in the generation of molecular force fields, artificial intelligence research, and novel method performance uh, uh, assessment. So uh, as you see here, there are, uh, we have links for the Google Doc where you can uh, answer questions for uh, Dan and Ben. Uh, there is a survey at the end also that would like uh, you to give us some feedback. These slides and the recording will be available uh, next week and you have the two links there where we'll be able to find uh, the slides, the recording and also the questions and answers uh, through the, uh, 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 the webinar. So with that, Dan and Ben, please you take over. Great, Osni, thank you for the introduction. One moment. All right, can you see your screen? Yes. Yes, great, thank you. Uh, so as Ozzy mentioned, uh, my name is Daniel. Uh, ben is joining me to uh, present uh, some of our open source best practices that we, that we view. Um, before launching too much into those, I thought we'd uh, give a brief overview of the next year so that you can have a general idea of uh, effectively where we're coming from. Uh, so as Ozzy mentioned, we're mostly focused on computational molecular science, uh, where computational molecular science has everything from uh, quantum chemistry and quantum materials all the way up to coarse grain molecular dynamic simulation. Uh, so any kind of computational aspects dealing with molecules, uh, we are uh, in this area. And I think one of the unique things about us is that uh, MULSI is really aiming to serve and enhance this community. Uh, so we're not really out to build, uh, for example, like new molecular dynamics or new quantum chemistry packages, um, but how can we uh, build software that's the base uh, infrastructure for all of these packages, uh, or how can we help them become more sustainable is really where we're focused. Uh, so we are only about uh, two years old at this point, a little over at this point, uh, and we are funded by the National Science, Sciences Foundation Software Infrastructure for Sustained Innovation uh, grants. Uh, and so because of this, uh, MULSI is the institute level grant of this, um, along with a couple of sister organizations such as the Science Gateways Community Institute. Uh, and so these are kind of a, a new effort by the NSF uh, to say, uh, can we take uh, effectively, instead of single PI grants or multi-PI grants, but actually make institute level uh, organizations within these fields uh, for the greater good? Um, so we're, we're a bit different uh, than I think you'll normally find. Uh, in addition, we are a collaborative effort um, by many universities uh, across the United States, as you can see listed here. Uh, we are formally headquartered in Blacksburg, Virginia, with 12 software scientists locally. Um, we also have uh, software fellows programs where we uh, support around 20 uh, graduate students and postdocs uh, across the United States. Um, so if you're interested in one of these fellowships, I, I suggest you should uh, look into one of our websites and we'll give you a link at the very end of that. 
Uh, so to give you kind of an idea of what we do, um, so as I mentioned, we do build uh, quite a bit of software infrastructure. Uh, so we have projects ranging from the ability to transform uh, different molecular dynamics inputs into other inputs. Uh, we also have things like large-scale quantum chemistry databases uh, and so on. So we do build quite a bit of software ourselves. Uh, we also have a lot of education and training. Uh, so we have quite a bit of online materials and tutorial guides, uh, which we'll give links to at the very end, which I hope you'll peruse. Um, and we also host uh, quite a few workshops. Uh, so these are either uh, these kind of like two-day boot camps that we hold around the country. Um, we also have these two-week-long summer schools. Uh, and then we do a host of uh, other more targeted uh, education programs, depending on exactly uh, the needs of, the, of a particular audience. Uh, and finally, uh, probably one of our, our most important things is the community outreach and engagement. Uh, so we spend a lot of time talking to our community, trying to figure out uh, data standards and best practices. Um, and we also try to uh, effectively um, get a little bit more cohesion uh, in API and data standards so that uh, things are a little bit more transferable and interoperable uh, and effectively more usable uh, in our particular space. Uh, so we do a lot more than this, um, but I think these are the three main thrusts uh, that we want to uh, go over. Uh, so I, I think uh, that's all I really want to talk about at MULSI because this is really about uh, our software uh, open source best practices. Um, so when we were putting together this talk, uh, what we did was we, we've been going to these webinars uh, for quite some time and uh, we, we see all these terms thrown around. Um, and, and I think we agree with all these terms across the board, uh, but what we wanted to do is spend a little bit of time illuminating what would uh, an example of best practices DevOps and open source be. Um, so we, uh, we went through all these things and we want to give these kind of like concrete examples. Uh, in addition, one thing that we, we see a lot, uh, but we haven't really quite seen mentioned, um, was this just get the physics working when it comes to software. Uh, so a lot of times um, we have software that are designed by a graduate student for a specific project, uh, and the question becomes, you know, if we need to maintain the software, we need to edit it later, um, what are some practices employed so that we can spend a little bit of time up front to save us a lot of time in the long run? Um, and this is really what these open source uh, best practices are about. Uh, and on the term best, uh, I think this term is thrown around uh, quite a bit. And so I, I think this is a completely subjective term. Um, so I think that there are a couple of practices that we think are very core uh, to, to all best practices. Um, but this really depends on your community, your audience, the kind of software that you're building, et cetera. Uh, so we kind of want to give an overview uh, of different possibilities of best practice. Yeah, and uh, again, this talk is really about uh, practical applications um, because ultimately with best practices, the, the idea there is to make your lives easier. Um, so they, they do take a little bit of time, but the hope is that overall it saves you quite a bit of time in terms of software development. Uh, so to begin at the very top, uh, we want to talk about what open source is. Uh, so there's an organization called the Open Source Initiative, uh, which in some ways is kind of a, a single definition of what open source is. Um, of course, open source being open source, uh, there's not a single definition, but many. Um, but I think this is a very reasonable starting point to kind of discuss this particular topic. Um, and so uh, OSI has come out with this uh, very uh, legal sounding statement of exactly what open source is. Uh, and I guess from our perspective, um, it really kind of hinges on three really major points. Um, so the first one is going to be uh, free distribution and charge of the program. Uh, so effectively what this means is that uh, a lot of the open source codes that we find, um, they're distributed um, by many different people in many different contexts. Um, so I think a good example is one of the programs that we work with a lot. Uh, we, you can find it on things like um, Ubuntu and Fedora's package manager, which uh, the primary authors actually had nothing to do with, and it was supported um, by uh, people interested in those particular regimes. So having it free and open charge and easily distributable is very key. Um, the other thing is that the source code is freely available. Uh, and what this means is that uh, anyone can go to a website without any kind of contract or license uh, to examine uh, what the source code is. Uh, and we're seeing this more and more uh, in so many different industries, not only the scientific one, um, where tools like uh, version control tools like GitHub uh, make the viewing and editing of source code extremely easy to do. And the other thing is going to be the uh, uh, basically the application of derived works. Um, so I think there's uh, many cases 
that we've seen where uh, perhaps the primary authors of this work um, did not uh, have one particular feature that someone else needed, um, so they, uh, they modify the program uh, to best suit their needs. Um, we always hope, of course, that these features uh, will, will come back to the primary program, um, but sometimes they do not. Uh, but I guess from our perspective, this is really um, the three main pillars that open source uh, really revolves around. Um, and if you want to look into all the individual details of what the open source initiative defines um, as being open source, I, I would encourage you to look through their website. Um, and so uh, we want to talk about what are the benefits of open source, both from a community point of view and a personal point of view. Um, so I think from a, a community point of view, uh, open source actually allows you to build these communities very easily. Um, because they're uh, completely open that anyone can join, um, it becomes trivial for someone who's not normally part of your ecosystem uh, to go ahead and start making changes. Um, and in fact, a lot of what our best practices around uh, is both making it easy for users to make changes and making sure that the changes that they make is very beneficial to your code. Uh, the other thing uh, that we really find is that open source really allows this common goal execution. Um, so there, there's uh, quite a few examples as seen below. Um, so everything from the Apache to the Linux Software Foundation, um, which rely on open source and basically this common goal where um, everyone from uh, open source developers to commercial entities uh, often contribute to every single one of these very large programs that we have shown. Um, I think things like the, uh, the Linux Foundation are, are particularly in this category, um, where with Linux you have uh, tons of open source developers in very many aspects, um, but then these days uh, there's quite a few developers at companies like Microsoft and Apple which are contributing to these core programs. Um, so if you can build an ecosystem of size, you get an enormous benefit from it. Uh, and then from a personal point of view, uh, I think here at Multi, what we found is open source really helps with coding skills. Uh, there's, there's so many cases where uh, a single person coding doesn't really get a lot of review and feedback. Um, but this is actually one of the main pillars of open source. You constantly get feedback on your work on how to improve. Um, there's also this uh, enormous, uh, basically, user base that can look at and comment on different approaches. So you, you have so many different people um, coming in and saying, well, you know, this is the tool that you're looking at, but you, know, you might want to suggest this one to see if it matches your use case. Um, and so it, it gives you a lot of power to find really the right tool for the right job. Um, we also have a lot of peer recognition involved. Um, I, I think one of the really nice things is that uh, people can always see exactly what you've done. Um, so if you're applying for some sort of company um, and you want a resume, uh, almost always uh, some sort of open source version controlled software is going to be a part of it. Uh, because uh, most of these companies actually use some sort of version control internally, um, so you're able to practice um, something in a very public fashion that people can evaluate um, and have a much better idea of what they're getting in terms of the software developer. Um, so I think these are both the uh, community and private reasons to look into open source. And uh, with that, I think we're going to dive a little bit into uh, version control. Um, but before we do, uh, I wanted to see if there are any questions that we could go ahead and answer. So far, there are no questions in the Google Doc that we haven't answered thus far. Okay, great. Uh, so in this case, I'll turn it over to Ben for a little bit, and he will talk about version control. Um, all right, so um, first we want to talk about version control. Um, so what is version control? Um, it, is, it is a program or a set of programs that tracks the changes to the code over time and who makes those changes. Um, this is very important. This is going to be the main way that you interact with your code and how the community interacts with your code. Um, a lot of times I've seen in scientific software, you know, you might just have comments at the top of the, the source code file, um, and the comment is just somebody's initials and what they've done. What they've done. Um, this does not count as, as proper version control. Um, so by far nowadays, Git is the most popular. Um, there are other subversion or uh, Mercurial, um, but in general, we really recommend Git. Now, Git itself can be fairly complicated, and we really, really recommend that you take the time to learn um, Git or whatever version control you're using. 
Um, so for Git, I know there are lots of great tutorials. There's lots of good YouTube videos. Um, you can take a boot camp on it. Really take a day or two to learn that because this is going to be an extremely important tool for how you are interacting with your code. Um, this is a foundation of your community and, and you really should learn it. Um, so in the, in the figure you can see um, a Git history that I've taken from uh, a fairly popular project, it's the Sci4 project. Um, and you can see you know, who is committed what and when they committed it. Um, this allows you to you know, assign credit, as Daniel mentioned. You know, credit is important in our field. Um, uh, on the flip side, you can also assign blame if somebody makes a mistake. Um, somebody has commits bad code, you can see who did it and when. Um, Git repositories are often hosted on the cloud. Um, so there's, uh, the logos of three popular services there at the bottom, GitHub, GitLab, Bitbucket. Um, GitHub is by far, I believe, the most popular. Um, but there are many projects that are using the others. So we've all hit, downloaded something at some point, and the first time you try to run it, it, it doesn't work or it breaks. Um, mistakes in software, this is a uh, a quote by Neil, um, mistakes in software erode trust in research and researchers. Now, and Neil gave a presentation, uh, two presentations ago, um, about this kind of topic. Um, so one of the ways we can improve the reliability and, and make our software much more trustworthy is with testing. Um, there's lots of different ways you can test code. Um, so I have, you know, uh, five different categories um, that it's commonly broken down into. So unit testing is where you're going to test a very small portion of your code, usually a function or maybe a small class. Uh, integration testing, you're going to test the interoperation of several units together. Uh, regression testing is one that is less commonly done in science. That is where um, somebody submits a bug report, you fix the bug, you create a test to make sure that that bug is never reintroduced again in the future. So it's obvious somebody is doing something that is now depending on that bug being fixed. Um, add a test, make sure it doesn't happen again. Um, smoke testing is what I believe a lot of scientific software does almost exclusively. And that's where you're doing a sanity test of the entire system. Does it crash? Does it get the right answer? Um, and then acceptance testing um, is something that is also somewhat commonly done. Uh, you test that a feature is correctly implemented. So you add a new feature, you add a test. Um, and that is highly recommended by us too. Um, one thing that is commonly missed is testing of failure modes. Um, this is something that we encourage, but uh, you don't have to go overboard. Um, so what we mean by testing of failure modes is when you give your software a bad input, and it should fail, does it actually fail? Or does it keep going? Does it do something completely unexpected? Um, there's lots of different ways software can fail, so you can spend your time, all your time writing tests for failure modes, but um, you know, just a couple quick uh, sanity tests that your code fails when it should um, can really be helpful. Okay, we all know we should test. We know what we should test. How do we test it? Uh, depends on the language, depends on what's in vogue at the time. Um, our recommendation is generally just to pick a common appropriate testing framework and do not write your own unless you really have to. Um, and it's going to be very rare that you have to write your own. So these testing frameworks provide a lot of features. They provide you know, uh, segmenting or grouping tests into categories, slow test, fast test, um, you know, maybe feature test. Um, they all have, they usually have timing, usually you can detect failures when exceptions are thrown, seg faults. Um, so there's lots of features uh, that these provide um, that should be useful. Um, so some popular ones uh, for C and C++, um, if you're using CMake, um, 
we recommend just using ctest. Uh, Catch2 is another up and coming testing framework. Um, for Python, of course, the standard is PyTest. Uh, and for Fortran, uh, again, you can build Fortran with CMake. So if you're using CMake, uh, again, use ctest. Um, so the figures show, you know, these are outputs of uh, a PyTest and a, a CMake ctest run um, and all the information that it can give you. Okay, so now you know what you should test, and now you're testing them with some sort of testing framework. Uh, what can you do with it? Well, you can set up something known as continuous integration. And then here, testing is done automatically when commits are made, um, usually to your, your cloud-hosted repository. Um, one common feature of this is that the results are displayed publicly. Um, so you see in the figures, uh, there's a badge for a, a build, so passing or failing. Um, displaying it publicly allows, um, really develops trust in your software package. And, and it really makes developers feel safer in, in contributing. So if you're a small, uh, you know, a single person developer and you have an idea for a new feature to add to a large package, you might be a bit hesitant because you think you might end up breaking everything that's already there. But if that big package has thorough testing, well, you can add your, the code that you want to add. As long as the test pass, then you should be okay. And if it does have thorough testing and you do add something and it does break the big package, well, that's kind of their fault for not testing properly. Um, so if people add badges, badges are pretty popular. It's also an incentive to really fix. So if builds are failing, you get this big red badge. Uh, when I see that on my project, I, I really feel inclined to fix that uh, as quickly as possible. Um, so you don't have to just do testing with CI. There's a couple different things. You can build documentation, upload documentation. Um, one thing you will sometimes see is continuous deployment, which is where you do your continuous integration step, your testing, your building, and then you will actually deploy a, a service. This is not common in scientific software. Um, but it's a term you should be aware of. So this is common in something like you're, you're hosting a web service. So every change you commit ends up being reflected in the web service. Um, some common features of CI matrix builds. This is where you can uh, test different permutations of, of different features. So compiler versions, compiler vendors, Python versions, library versions, um, again, this can go, go overboard with all different combinations, um, but you see the example there. Um, this project is testing with Clang, with a certain Python version, and GCC, with a different Python version, and GCC6, with a different Python version. Trying to cover, you know, a lot of the common permutations of Python and GCC that are out in the field. So you can test, you know, different distributions, uh, operating systems, uh, different versions of dependencies, CI is usually um, integrated with your version control, so it is very seamless with GitHub and GitLab. Um, and it's often integrated with social services, such as Slack. Um, you can have it pop up the message in Slack when builds failed, fail or succeed. Um, you can get an email uh, when builds failed or succeed. Um, so integrations are, are very popular with developers. Um, so this leads to a, a very common development workflow, and I am, I am glossing over many details. Um, but the workflow uh, is commonly called the, the fork pull model. So in this uh, model, um, the, the developer is going to fork uh, the master repository, which means he's going to make a copy of it locally for himself. Um, and then they are going to um, develop on it. They're going to hack on it add their code, modify the code, and then eventually they're going to submit a pull request, which tells the, the developers um, of the main package that they would like to merge their code back into the master branch. Um, and then within the pull request, there's going to be debate, do the test pass, is the code quality good, um, is it formatted correctly, 
is it a feature that's really needed? Um, and then if, if it is accepted, it will be merged back into the, the master branch. Um, so, so key features, right? The development happens on an independent branch and repository. Um, and it's common to see projects where modifications only happen in these branches. Um, there's nothing ever committed directly to master. Um, yeah, the code in, is reviewed and tested. Again, those tests you wrote are actually very useful. And then if it's accepted, the code is merged from the master branch. Um, the, the commit authors remain along with their commits, so they get credit and it shows up in the master branch. And so I think this kind of uh, fulfills kind of like what we think is like the primary pillars of open source uh, is having uh, testing and CI along with some sort of version control uh, in this kind of workflow. And if we look out uh, at virtually any project uh, online that's open source, they, they almost always uh, follow this kind of pattern. Uh, and at the very end of the talk, we'll give you uh, quite a few different code bases um, that are kind of like big uh, quantum chemistry and molecular dynamics codes uh, online, which you can kind of see these best practices being applied to. Um, and I think uh, this is also the end of what we think of as like, like the truly core best practices. So I, I think it's safe to say that these best practices are extremely transferable um, across any domain and any feature set. Um, so I, I would encourage you to uh, look into them, and we'll also give you links to tutorials if you'd like to supply, um, if you'd like to do some uh, exploration on your own. Uh, and at this point, um, we'll probably take uh, questions if you have anything. Yeah, uh, yes, there is one question, Dan. Um, I've been using CPPU test. Should I switch? <laughs> uh, so uh, CPPU test uh, is really great for C projects. Um, it is primarily a C testing code. Uh, and I would, I would say that it's completely up to you. If you're really happy with it, then uh, you probably do not want to switch. Um, if you have some features that are missing, uh, you may uh, want to consider switching. Um, I think, I think uh, uh, one of the things that, 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 I'm sorry, we're getting feedback. Yeah. Uh, okay, great. Uh, so we, what we really try to exercise is use whatever is useful to you. Um, you know, if it's a huge investment to switch and it fills all your needs, then there's no reason to switch. Um, I think something like Catch 2 uh, is really great for modern C++. So if you're C++ 11 or above, then, you know, you might want to look into it. Um, if you have a pure C code, then, uh, you know, uh, Catch 2 probably isn't quite appropriate. Um, so it completely depends on your circumstance. And um, if you want to talk about pros and negatives more, um, we're happy to chat if you want to reach out to us. Okay. Um, okay, so there's one more slide on CI, and that is, um, you know, what, what services are available um, to actually help you do your, your continuous integration. Um, they, they can be cloud-based, or you can use your own hardware. Um, and many or most of these are free for open source projects. Um, okay, so cloud hosted Travis is very popular on GitHub. Um, Circle CI is a similar competitor. Um, they both do uh, Linux and OS X. Uh, if you are building for Windows, then you can use AppVare. Um, Azure Pipelines, I guess Daniel can uh, attest to uh, is very powerful and very flexible, um, but with that power and flexibility comes complexity in, in setting it up. Highly complicated, but extremely powerful. Uh, very powerful and very generous, I hear, in their, um, in their resource allotment. Um, for locally hosted, if, if you have special hardware that you need to run on, um, you know, you might do this with GPUs, um, if you have very, very stringent requirements, um, Jenkins is probably the most popular, just completely open source one. You host it yourself, um, you host the hardware, and um, it will connect to GitHub and, and run the CI on your hardware. Um, BuildBot is another one. It's very flexible. It's written in Python. It's probably the most flexible one I've used. Um, 
but sometimes you know integration is a bit iffy. Um, Team City is kind of a hybrid. The, the, the dashboard is is actually cloud hosted, um, but you can run the the build tasks on your own hardware. Um, so you can download a package onto your server and then connect it to your Team City dashboard that's in the cloud. Um, so those are the ones that we consider most popular. Um, I think Travis is probably by far the most popular. Uh, and so there's one quick question that uh, asked us if there's any cloud-based ser uh, CI services that include GPUs. Uh, so not at the moment. Um, NVIDIA is trying very hard to spin up an NVIDIA-based uh, cloud CI service. Uh, I unfortunately do not know the uh, current status of that. Uh, I think the by far and large, if you need GPUs, uh, most people use local machines um, with one of these locally hosted CI services by far. Uh, the other one is uh, GitLab CI. Um, so we do like GitLab CI uh, quite a bit. Um, however, uh, I think we find it um, uh, perhaps like almost like a little bit more limiting uh, than we'd originally hoped. Um, so it, it really depends on like what your use case is. Uh, it, it's, it's hard to say too much um, about all the different CI services um, which, uh, without knowing exactly uh, what, you're, what, what each project's doing. Um, but I would encourage you to kind of like always evaluate like what is the feature set that you're looking for, um, what are the pros and cons with each of these CI packages um, before moving in. Um, and another question is, uh, yes, uh, so supercomputers are beginning to allow CI-like services. Um, so when we talked about testing, we mostly talked about um, effectively some sort of uh, application-based testing. Um, but another piece of testing that we probably didn't talk about as much is integration testing. Um, more importantly, like regression testing on these big machines. It's, it's very hard to tell, uh, for example, if like uh, some sort of code change um, effectively made uh, running on 4,000 nodes slower or faster um, without actually doing that. Um, so uh, testing uh, can get quite complicated. Um, and so mostly uh, these CI services um, are kind of like your initial stick test. Um, so does the project build, um, does like a reasonable set of tests pass, um, but unfortunately for running on really large HPC resources, um, there's still really no substitute besides actually doing that. I think we should probably move on. I think there's a lot of questions and we might be able to answer some at the end. Does that sound okay, Ozzy? Yes, it does. Okay, great. So uh, as we mentioned, uh, we believe that these were kind of the, the really core uh, things that most projects that are open source should be looking at doing. Um, we think that uh, they really help build uh, trust, um, both from a community standpoint and from a new developer standpoint. Um, one of the biggest fears that we hear from new developers is simply the fact that they're worried about breaking a piece of code. Um, the second largest fear uh, that we hear is, of course, um, they're nervous about putting their code out, out there for every, anyone to review, um, which uh, is a bit harder to overcome. But in terms of like breaking the code, uh, we really find uh, continuous integration to be very powerful because what we try to tell users is that uh, if it's successfully built uh, on your continuous integration platform and anything breaks after that, that's the fault of the primary developers uh, and not any kind of uh, new user, new developer issue. And uh, on this, uh, one thing that uh, uh, basically helps projects quite a bit is going to be code coverage and trying to analyze how well that they're doing in testing. Uh, so oftentimes you find that projects that do not have code coverage um, spend a lot of time testing a very small percentage of their code uh, and have very large swaths of their code being untested. Um, so I'd like to mention um, about this code coverage, it effectively measures what percentage of uh, number of lines of code ever tested. Um, and uh, two important things about this is that 100% uh, code coverage, does that mean that your code isn't perfect by any stretch of the means? Um, this is simply a heuristic, seeing how much of your code is covered. Um, the other thing that we like about it is that it's, it's a very hard metric uh, to, to fake or to um, accidentally uh, you know, do very well on. Um, almost in every single case, you actually have to really um, cover a very large amount of the code to have a good score on this. 
Um, and so to give an example of code coverage is uh, I pulled off uh, one of these uh, starburst patterns that we see in a lot of these uh, coverage testing tools. Uh, and so these really um, bright green areas mean virtually 100% testing. Um, and every single little notch either means a folder at the inner level um, or actually an individual file at the outer level. Uh, and so we can, we can see from this kind of starburst pattern that um, there's individual files that are virtually 100% tested, um, but these really dark red actually indicates 0% uh, test coverage. Um, and so this kind of gives you a quick overview of how well you're testing your code or not, and it also gives you places where you might want to consider writing tests. Um, so this is why we like code coverage. Uh, and so this is kind of an, a, an example of like what one of these um, code coverage tools will do, the online versions of them. Uh, and in this particular case, uh, I think a lot of times that we see is uh, people miss uh, various if statements. Um, so they, they usually only test like one particular branch of the pathway. Um, you know, sometimes this is okay, but it's always worth at least looking into. Uh, and the other fun thing is that exceptions are often not tested uh, in general. And um, what we find quite a few times is that uh, because these exceptions are never tested, um, people actually evaluate into these code paths uh, when an exception should be thrown. So instead of getting a nice error message, um, they actually get uh, some sort of you know, segmentation fault or the like because um, an incorrect branch was evaluated. Um, so uh, code coverage is pretty easy to set up and kind of gives you a general idea of how well you're doing your testing. Uh, so there's a number of uh, services online, such as CodeCub and Coveralls. Um, there's tools for virtually every interpreted and compiled language um, that we're aware of that will do code coverage. Um, so it's a fairly popular thing uh, out in the world. Um, another thing uh, very similar to this uh, that we find to be very helpful is going to be uh, code formatters. And so what a code formatter does uh, is they turn um, all of the code into a very systematic piece of software where the indentation style, you know, where I put a bracket, et cetera, uh, is the same throughout the entire code. Uh, and particularly for open source, when you have a lot of developers working on this code or when you have someone new to your code trying to look and see what it does, um, this is very helpful because it provides kind of like this uniform uh, look and feel to a code and reduces the overall cognitive overhead of trying to examine and figure out what it's doing. Um, so we, we believe these things are, are really quite nice for open source. Um, they're also really nice to use. Uh, they usually integrate with IDEs. Um, they also have command line tools which will just automatically format um, an entire project with one line. Uh, one of the interesting things about this is that uh, several languages have a single um, standard. So, for example, Python has something called the PEP8, um, which uh, effectively everyone uses within the Python world. Um, but then languages like C and C++ actually have uh, multiple standards um, depending on uh, who you talk to. Uh, so, for example, like C++, there's uh, Clang and um, uh, GNU style and Google style. Uh, code formatting. And each of them are, are relatively similar, but still a little bit different. Um, and uh, for example, like a tool to format C++ actually allows you to pick between them. Um, and from our standpoint, it really doesn't matter which one you pick, uh, but we do believe that um, actually applying a code formatter um, to your entire code base uh, does make it more readable and a bit more friendly to new users, which is going to be very important to your ecosystem. Uh, again, these things are quite widely uh, developed, um, so we're able to find uh, ones, again, for virtually any compiled languages, um, simply by Googling code formatter plus the language that you're interested in. Um, for us, we really like plain format for C++, um, and we really enjoy uh, YAP for Python, um, YAP being yet another Python formatter. <clears throat> And uh, so I believe those two tools, um, we see them a lot in open source projects, um, you know, clearly not as much as the continuous integration uh, and testing, but, but still I'd say in over half the projects that we encounter. Um, the other popular tool that I'd still say is experimental is the static code quality analysis tools. Um, and so what's nice about them is they're able to examine the entire code base without any kind of testing. Um, or writing tests yourself, and they kind of iteratively go through and try to find um, known bugs, so things like buffer overflows or unreachable code, um, automatically for you. And uh, this is really nice from a kind of reviewer point of view, 
um, where you can uh, rely a little bit on the static analysis tool to kind of get like all of the simple errors that you know, a new pull request or even yourself uh, might make. And so it kind of uh, removes a little bit of the cognitive overhead of like, oh, maybe I have a new pull request that, in, that includes this new module. Well, do I need that module or not? Um, well, a static analysis tool will immediately tell you if that was an unneeded import or not. Uh, the other thing that we like about it is um, it, it helps keep uh, basically reviewer um, pull request uh, maker uh, relations uh, very easy. Um, it, it, it's a lot harder for a reviewer to say, you know, hey, this thing's wrong, this thing's wrong, and this thing's wrong. Um, and one of the funny things that we found over time is that bad news is always easier from a bot. Um, so it, it's a very nice way of kind of getting uh, all the base um, and sort of easy errors to uh, so basically make sure that your code um, uh, continues to be clean. Um, okay, so question, do we know any good static analysis or linters for Fortran? Uh, I don't. Yeah, unfortunately, uh, for static analysis, we do not know a static linter for Fortran yet. Um, any other language, uh, we have one, and it's certainly possible that uh, we might be able to get static linters through basically the GNU ecosystem uh, because they seem to uh, be um, effectively expanding these kinds of things. So we have formatters for it um, through the GNU ecosystem, and we'll, we'll see, uh, I would say, on that. Uh, I wanted to give um, just a couple little examples of uh, what code quality does. Um, so for, you know, I think a, a kind of a popular error that we see um, is that I might redefine axis inside of like an external scope and an internal scope twice. Um, this is kind of hard for a human to catch because it basically means that I have to like understand all 40 variables in the external scope and all 40 variables in the internal scope and look for mismatches. Um, for something like static analysis, it's very easy for it to pick up, and so it can always find these uh, in a very simple manner and alert you to them. Uh, the other thing that it's nice at is uh, looking for uh, potential errors. Um, so probably the most common one that we see in compiled languages um, is possibilities of uh, buffer overflows uh, or the like, um, which um, it has been uh, really quite nice because it, it catches them all. Like it doesn't even, you know, catch like 40%, which a human might, um, but every single possible case it at least alerts you to. You don't always have to make a change or you don't have to um, modify the code, but at least you're aware of possible errors that kind of creep up. Uh, in addition, we found that static linters will also uh, catch higher level issues. Um, so in this particular one, uh, it caught this uh, potential code duplication, where if I looked at um, this list final energies function and list final molecules function, I found that the code is actually 90% correct. Um, and what the static linter is telling me is that I should probably refactor that um, into you know, two functions that call a common function at the end of the day. Um, and in fact, is what we do. Um, so we're, we're finding static linters uh, to be quite, a, quite useful. Um, I would still say that they are fairly um, experimental overall. Um, we're finding them useful, but there's also cases where they're, they're not quite right. Um, and uh, I think one case where they're a little bit not quite right is they can be overzealous in their warnings. Um, one service that we tried uh, effectively um, was very concerned about cyclomatic complexity, and effectively any function that was more than about 100 lines um, through an error. And I think in, in most code, uh, having you know, individual functions below 100 lines is probably doable, um, but in most scientific code, it seems that uh, individual functions are often much, much larger than that. Um, so trying to find a static linter that's uh, more specific uh, on your domain um, is going to be more difficult uh, than perhaps something like CI, which is extremely general. Um, for us, we are really starting to like uh, LGTM. Uh, these folks have been around uh, not too long, um, but we believe the tool kind of hits like just the right stride of trying to give you enough information without overwhelming you or throwing too many errors. Um, what's nice about it is it's able to do hybrid projects. Um, so this is a LGTM on a project that actually has C, C++, JavaScript, and Python all in it, and it was able to apply LGTM analysis to every single language there. Um, so there's LGTM and CoClimate and Pyflakes, depending on various languages. Um, as I mentioned, uh, I, I found them for most languages out there, but unfortunately not Fortran quite yet. Um, but hopefully, hopefully sometime soon someone will get that out there, because these tools are constantly improving and expanding. 
Yeah. And so I think these are the tools that we find really useful. Um, but as we mentioned at the beginning, um, there's, there's such a litany of tools out there. Um, so what we did was we pulled up a GitHub Marketplace to give you an idea. Um, there's probably 120 tools uh, on this website that you can use free of charge. Um, what is nice is almost all these tools are actually commercial products, um, which are given to you free for open source code. Um, so everyone gains uh, quite a bit out of them. Uh, so there's things like different kinds of dashboards. There's uh, agile boards if you do agile processes. Um, for us, we're getting more into uh, web servers, so vulnerability checkers for like SQL injection, uh, there's things like this. Uh, stuff that does dependency management to watch for dependency changes and does automatic incre increments and the like. So effectively, if there's something that you need, there's probably a tool out there for it. Um, I guess my only caution is, again, you really want to um, evaluate any tool before you bring it in, and as you bring it in, to make sure that it's actually saving you time. Um, I think you can certainly go overboard on these tools where you spend far too much time um, dealing with the tool itself rather than writing your code. And really what this is about uh, is uh, enhancing your ability to write software and making your software more sustainable and more friendly to either yourself developing in the future or someone else developing in the future. Um, so again, always evaluate if these things are correct for you. Uh, before I jump into the next section, I want to take questions real quick, if I have anything that I can answer. Um, no, I think you can continue. Okay, great. We'll take a look at back, we'll go back to the questions at the end. Okay, good. So uh, there's, there's a lot of um, open source best practices and trying to do all these completely from scratch, uh, especially on your own if you're not used to them, uh, can be uh, fairly complicated and a little bit tedious. Uh, so one of the things that we try to do is we try to build uh, cookie cutters. Uh, and so what a cookie cutter does is uh, for a given language, it attempts to set up a project and, and I quote, the right way. Um, and of course, as we discussed, you know, the right way can mean uh, many different things to many different people. Um, but in this case, uh, we have a cookie cutter that we believe is appropriate for um, uh, the Python language for the Computational Molecular Sciences crowd. Uh, and so um, what you can do is you download this cookie cutter. Uh, you answer about six different questions, uh, ranging from um, do you want to use uh, PIP or Conda, which are popular uh, Python dependency managers? Um, what kind of open source language? Um, sorry, what kind of license do you want? Um, you can pick your own, of course. Uh, and what it'll do is it'll go ahead and it will set up uh, the entire project for you. So it'll lay out the Python in an economical way. Um, it'll build uh, all the initial files that you require to actually get the project off the ground. Um, and it also build things like a dev tools folder um, which will allow you to um, push your project to dependency management systems. Um, it'll set up all the continuous integration, testing, code coverage, and documentation for you. Um, and, and so from looking at um, a lot of projects, uh, Python projects online, including things like the NumFocus uh, uh, organization, which houses things like SciPy and NumPy and IPython and the like, um, we kind of said, what are the best practices that these guys employ? Um, what do our users need? And um, this is the result uh, where you can set up uh, everything that falls underneath our best practices in, um, I'd say, about five minutes if you're used to it, uh, or about 20 minutes um, if you've never touched these tools before. Um, so we're trying to uh, make these things very friendly and very easy to use. Uh, and of course, if you uh, use them uh, and you had any, any issues with them, um, you can always make actually an issue uh, on that GitHub uh, repository, which contains it, um, or you can feel free to email Ben or I, and we will attempt to help you through it. Um, so uh, we're checking out if you uh, like the Python language, and we'll get you quickly up to speed on um, all the topics that we discussed. Um, so I'd say in summary, uh, the, the, the main tools that we're really looking for is uh, version control, which helps you build community. It helps uh, new users build out their, uh, effectively their resume. Um, we think that testing is probably across the board an incredibly important thing to do. It uh, really gives you an assessment if your code is correct or not. And um, so many times we've seen very small changes effectively invalidate large parts of, a, of, a, of these code bases. Um, so testing is very crucial. Uh, continuous integration, again, this is extremely important for building a community. Uh, it makes sure that uh, new developers 
um, feel very comfortable uh, contributing to your code. Uh, you can also test um, such a range of different build systems on, on different uh, OSs, different compilers, et cetera, uh, automatically. So it actually saves quite a bit of developer time as well. Uh, so again, we think those three are kind of the best practices that um, kind of move across the board. Um, code coverage and formatters, uh, we think that these uh, tools everyone should at least look into. Um, we think that they're very useful. Um, so I think those are the big five, and of course these new static analysis tools are kind of uh, on the edge. So we'll see how they, they work over the next six months or so. Um, but again, the, the, the whole reason for doing this is it really aims to save developer time. It, it takes, um, you know, at the minimum, you know, 10, 15 minutes to set the, these things up. Um, if you have an extremely complicated code base, you can usually get them up and running in a day. Um, but at the end of the day, that we hope that it saves you time, which is the, the biggest thing about these, is it tries to catch errors before they happen, and it tries to alert you to errors that do happen. Um, the other thing is we found that these, these, these ideas and these tools try to make it welcoming to new developers, which is crucial for open source to work, um, because you would like uh, to effectively share the load in managing and developing these big codes. Um, and if anything, I'd stress that all these best practices are always as balanced of developer and user time. Um, so whenever you're looking at these tools, always evaluate them carefully to see if you want to pick them up and making sure that they're absolutely right for you. Um, and I, I think uh, Neil from SSI who, who uh, talked about these communities to practice. Um, and I just want to come back to this real quick and say that, you know, this, this best is very subjective and depends on your individual community. Um, so these are a couple of organizations on the right-hand side that we look at. So they're the organization that we talk to, that we interact with, um, and we share our, our best practices with. Um, but again, this, this best really depends on, you know, what is your target audience, what is the size of your project, and what is the activity level of the project that you have. Um, but we really do hope that these uh, are core good ideas um, or, or we think are, are virtually important for every single project out there. Um, so, uh, you know, look into our tools. Uh, we have plenty of guides online which will give an example of the, at the end. Uh, each of these organizations also provides tons of tutorials and information if you're interested in these practices as well. And for our particular, uh, basically, uh, community of practice, um, we have a couple codes up here that employ these best practices. Uh, so in the molecular dynamics regime, there's uh, LAMPS and OpenMM. Um, and you can see that uh, both of these codes are on GitHub. They employ CI uh, through various means, depending on their builds and requirements. Um, for quantum mechanics, uh, there's NWCM and Site 4 uh, Again, they have GitHub and CI and code coverage. Um, and if you click on uh, each of these, if you have the slides, it will take you to the GitHub page where you can see um, exactly how these codes have applied these best practices. You know, what are, what are the small details that they did um, and how do they present them to the user? Uh, so I, I would encourage you to look into each of these uh, if you're interested in this practice. Uh, and uh, I wanted to point out two additional Python utility codes. Um, if you have things that are in pure Python, it's usually a little bit uh, easier to go a bit farther um, in terms of uh, like code coverage and static analysis. Um, so if you want to look into examples that try to cover um, everything that we touched on, um, this opt einstein package for tensor order contraction uh, and QC fractal for uh, large scale quantum chemistry databases are two tools to look into to see how they, they apply these practices. Um, and so with that, uh, I think I've covered uh, everything today. Um, if you would like to see more about our best practices, the cookie cutter or emailing list, um, all of the links on this particular page. Uh, and we thank you so much for your time and we look forward to any questions that you may have. Thank you, Dan. Thank you, Ben. Um, I was looking here at the Google Doc. I think you answered all the questions, I believe. There is only one that I don't recall, uh, a question related. Uh, what about GitLab CI? Have you? Yeah, so um, we, we use GitLab CI uh, occasionally. Um, uh, so for example, I think uh, another project that we could have linked to on GitLab that uses this is something called LibXC. Um, which is a really great uh, program which uh, effectively gives access to hundreds of DFT functionals um, for quantum mechanics. Uh, and, and so I know that one in particular uses uh, 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 GitLab CI pipelines. 
Um, GitLab CI pipelines are in general pretty generous in the amount of CPU time that they provide. Um, and it, again, it depends on your use case. Uh, if you're there in GitLab, then you, know, you probably want to consider integrating those. Um, if you're on another service like uh, you know, GitHub, then you have um, kind of like the whole breadth of tools to, to integrate with. Um, okay, so there is one uh, related to the um, Oak Ridge CI capabilities, but we'll answer that in a, in a different way. So what we're going to do, we'll, we'll ask Dan and Ben to go uh, over these questions and, uh, and revise the answers. And uh, next week, we're going to send a, look, uh, a link to everybody uh, with the recording and, uh, and the, the, um, the questions and answers. Ashley, uh, would you like to open the mic for a few minutes or? Yes, so since we still have five minutes, if you would like to unmute yourself and um, ask your questions that way, we, we have about five minutes before we have to um, leave. So if there's any pressing questions, please do unmute yourself. All right. I think we're good then, Osmi, if you want to uh, pull up your final slide. Yes, just give me a minute here. Yes, uh, so again, thank you all for participating. Uh, so I'd like to remind you, so um, if we're going to, you know, we'd like to have your feedback here so we can improve this series. And again, the recording will be available with the slides and the questions and answers um, by next, sometime next week. So the next webinar is going to be on December the 5th, and David Bernhold from Oak Ridge National Lab is going to talk about software licensing. Uh, there is uh, the link is already there where you can go and register. We are not going to have a webinar in November because of the C18 conference and a uh, uh, number of people or almost everybody uh, working on this project. Uh, the ECP, I think, lots of people are going to attend it, that conference. So then again, so the next webinar is on the, the December the 5th. Uh, it will be by David Bernhold on software licensing. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Ben. Thank you, uh, Dan. Take Thank you.